Hi, I'm J. Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader, and today we'll be talking about a terrific episode of the early 1950s science fiction TV anthology Tales of Tomorrow. I've written for Starlog, Film Facts, and Cult Movies Magazine, and the Reader published my in-depth history of this program a while back. It included interviews with show creators I taped over 30 years ago, some of which you can hear on these DVD commentaries. Well, this third episode of Tales of Tomorrow, A Child is Crying, was broadcast live as it was performed on August 17, 1951, on an ABC soundstage at East 66th Street in New York City. The show was still airing weekly at this time, though in a few weeks it would start alternating every other week with a show called Versatile Varieties. That show was about to end its two-year run on uh, multiple networks. Tales of Tomorrow ran every other week all the way up until late January 1952 and it went back to every week. If you already watched the first two episodes that preceded this in broadcast order, I'll remind you that the episode one ended with aliens blowing up the earth to stop our nuclear proliferation. And the second episode was about a dumbass mad scientist whose experiments in nuclear power destroy the entire planet's supply of oxygen. And things aren't looking much better for earth this week, it looks like it's those damn nukes again. The story concerns the government's attempts to use this young girl we see as a weapon. Uh, they want to use her as a Cold War tool because uh, she has displayed powerful mental abilities uh, that they want to put to work. The titular young mutant here, our child, who will soon be crying, is a 10-year-old girl who was a 7-year-old boy in the original story. And uh, her, her IQ so off the charts that the charts didn't even exist at the time. Uh, she's being interviewed by scientists, and she's baffling everyone with the way that she uses what she calls cyclic rhythm to predict the future. So, of course, the U.S. government, represented by both a general and a senator, wanted to go to work for them, especially when they realized that uh, she knows the future. Uh, she might know of an, en uh, an enemy attack. And of course, the girl refuses to reveal anything. She's too smart for that, and she fears that anything she says could set off a nuclear war, uh, although she does admit that there are a couple of dozen other mutant super kids spread out around the planet and uh, they might end up ruling the world after the inevitable Armageddon if we do end up blowing off our nuclear weapons. Uh, and she even says that uh, no more than 160 million people would survive. So it's a similar story you'll note to a, a movie that came out a few years later called The Space Children. Uh, that one also has a, a group of sort of mutant super intelligent kids. Uh, that one actually stars a young Russell Johnson, the professor from Gilligan's Island. Uh, he's, he plays a dad who's working for the government, and the kids are all acting uh, hyper-intelligent and spooky and, and trying to sabotage a nuclear test they're about to stage. It's also a notable resemblance to uh, a story that, uh, a creepy kid story that we all kind of know, The Midwich Cuckoos, published in 1957. And, uh, even more familiar to most of us when it was adapted as Village of the Damned three years later. And there's also a Tales of Tomorrow episode that would uh, air around six months after this one called The Children's Room. And that's about a whole breed of mutant super children who are attending classes on how to take over the world. Um, could, could be a sequel to this one. Uh, a Tales of Tomorrow episode called And a Little Child is about impending nuclear war that uh, can only be averted by a young psychic ch uh, mind reader. Anti-nukes uh, were, were, were like a big thing on Tales of Tomorrow. As I mentioned, the first two episodes uh, had nuclear proliferation being part of the storyline. Uh, Verdict from Space. Uh, it was one of the show's most uh, really frequently visited topics, along with Mad Scientist. Some episodes actually mixed the two. Um, the sci-fi terrorist in World of Water is a crazed nuclear engineer. He goes crazy over his daughter's death. Uh, the second episode, Blunder, had uh, nuclear toys causing our nuclear alien neighbors to blow up the Earth. Sneak Attack uh, is about nuclear bombs that are delivered by unmanned drone planes. Uh, Ahead of His Time features a uh, nuclear blunder that's so bad that time travelers from the future have to come back and try to stop us from irradiating the entire planet. And uh, Uranium Ore is the cause of the astronauts that, uh, one of the causes, the astronauts turning against each other in appointment on Mars. Uh, and then there's one called, an episode called The Great Silence with Burgess Meredith. It's one of the few comedic episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. And in that one, they, they blame the H-bomb at the beginning of it, at least, for uh, mysterious ailments that cause this whole remote region in the northeastern United States to become uh, unable to talk. Uh, but the blackout uh, turns out to be caused by aliens in that one rather than the hydrogen bomb. 
Uh, the mom here of the little girl, she's played by Peggy Allenby. I'll tell you a bit about her. Uh, she was in one other Tales of Tomorrow, the adaptation of Frankenstein that they did. She plays a maid who has an unfortunate run-in with Lon Chaney Jr. in that one, he, as the Frankenstein monster. This was actually one of her first acting roles. Around the same time, she was doing the, uh, the big anthologies on TV, like Studio One, uh, where she worked with future Boris Karloff's thriller producer, Fletcher Markle. Uh, she also did Armstrong Circle Theater, Cosmopolitan Theater, Philco Television Playhouse. Uh, she was in every episode of the 1954-1955 Patricia Berry TV soap opera, First Love. And uh, she was a regular also on the Edge of Night soap opera in the late 50s up through about 1963. Um, she passed away actually in uh, just two years after starring as Mrs. Santa Claus in the 1964 TV special Prologue for Christmas. Uh, the original story for this episode we're watching, A Child is Crying, was written by someone that you might be familiar with, John D. McDonald. He was the creator of the detective Travis McGee. Uh, movies based on his stories include Cape Fear, which was based on his novel The Executioner, also A Flash of Green, uh, and, and there's a TV movie called The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Everything. He also wrote the original story for the film Darker Than Amber was uh, about his character, Travis McGee, but he reportedly hated that so much that he vowed to never license that character for the movies again after seeing it. Uh, his fellow prolific author, Stephen King, once described John D. MacDonald as, quote, the great entertainer of our age and a mesmerizing storyteller, unquote. It was written by MacDonald. The original A Child is Crying ran over, uh, just, just under, rather, 4,000 words. It was a fairly short story. It was first published in the December 1948 issue of Thrilling Wonder Stories. The first adaptation of the story was actually just a couple years later, uh, in 1950, for the Lights Out TV show, a little bit before this one. And uh, that actually is probably one of the, the first professional TV or movie story credits that John D. McDonald would earn. Uh, the Lights Out version of A Child is Crying was also one of the first TV appearances of the future Naked Gun star Leslie Nielsen who was also in a few different uh, Tales of Tomorrows. Uh, the Tales of Tomorrow adaptation of A Child is Crying came less than a year after the Lights Out version. Uh, crazily enough, John D. MacDonald's third story ad ad adapted for television also featured Leslie Nielsen. That was a November 1951 episode of Out There called Susceptibility. And Out There, we don't talk about much, but it was pretty much the only other science fiction anthology on television at the same time as this. You could say CBS's version of Tales of Tomorrow uh, was an ABC show here. Uh, out there, however, didn't really run nearly as long. It only ran for around a year, I think maybe just over a dozen episodes. John D. McDonald's uh, stories were also adapted for TV anthologies like uh, the Fatal Impulse episode of Boris Karloff's Thriller. Uh, there was some for Alfred Hitchcock's TV show. There was even a 1985 episode of Tales from the Dark Side that adapted his story, Ring Around the Redhead. Pretty much all the versions of A Child is Crying share similarities to a short story called The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes by Margaret St. Clair. That was published uh, a couple of years after uh, A Child is Crying. It was in McLean's Magazine in 1950. Uh, and that story, The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes, that was later adapted for Rod Serling's Night Gallery. And the same episode of Night Gallery, uh, had a segment written by the same fellow who adapted A Child is Crying for this show, Alan Sapinsley, but we're going to get to him in a couple of minutes here. Let me read you a quote about A Child is uh, Crying that was uh, written by editor Martin Greenberg. He edited a 1978 anthology of John D. McDonald's work called Other Times, Other Worlds. And he referred, referred to this story as a minor classic, and he said that, quote, both the villain and the hero are functioning as an example of what was to become known as the atomic warning story. It was also, uh, it was one of the best of, by, of a large number of stories on this theme published in the late 1940s, unquote. Very true. Uh, in the original story, uh, the child, as I mentioned, is a seven-year-old boy. His name is Billy. And uh, I'll read you how John D. McDonald describes him in the story. He says, uh, Billy could, quote, read and write and carry on a conversation when he was 13 months old and at two and a half he was doing quadratic equations 
At four, completely on his own, he worked out theories regarding non-Euclidean geometry and theories of relativity that paralleled the work of Einstein, unquote. Boy, that is a mouthful. Uh, the story describes uh, the, the little boy's fortune-telling processes using what he calls cyclic rhythm, which is the same term used here in the uh, Tales of Tomorrow version. A lot of people actually believe that the little Billy is the inspiration behind uh, Roger Waters' anti-nuke concept album, Radio Chaos. That one's about a boy with mental powers who can use radio waves to control mechanical equipment, including nuclear launch systems and uh, uh, the lead character in that one is also named Billy, so I suppose that's a possibility. Uh, the teleplay here, the story was adapted by Alvin Sapinsley, who I mentioned earlier. And uh, he was writing for television pretty much right at the start of the medium. Around the same time uh, he was doing this show, uh, he did seven episodes of The Web, which is another sort of creepy anthology. He did 50 episodes of Suspense, which we talk about a lot in these uh, commentaries. Did a bunch of the real top shelf anthologies like Studio One, where Rod Serling was making his mark. And uh, he did Robert Montgomery Presents. He did, uh, I think he wrote 10 episodes of that. Alvin Sapinsley worked on two other Tales of Tomorrow episodes. I should mention he adapted uh, a story by Henry Cutner and C.L. Moore for the Dark Angel episode, starring Meg Mundy as a, another hyper intelligent and possibly mutant female. <clears throat> that one's all grown up and has. Uh, has physical superpowers too. He also wrote an original story and script for Tales of Tomorrow that was directed by the same director here, Don Medford, uh, and that episode was called Read to Me, Hair Doctor, about an old professor who builds a robot that reads, uh, intended to read books for him, but he, the robot instead falls in love with his daughter and enslaves the professor. Uh, so Pinsley's career was almost derailed actually when his name turned up on the Hollywood blacklist of suspected communist sympathizers. And that actually also happened to Tales of Tomorrow director Charles S. Dubin. The two of them, Dubin and Sapinsley, worked together on a Tales of Tomorrow episode, The Dark Angel I mentioned earlier. Uh, both of them did manage to keep their careers going, though, and Alvin Sapinsley later went on to uh, write for the 60s and 70s TV shows like The Man from Uncle, It Takes a Thief, Ironside, Kojak. Uh, he wrote a half dozen segments for Rod Serling's Night Gallery including some, some of our favorites around here. There aren't many more Big Banes since Aunt Ada came to stay, and, and a real terrific one called Pickman's Model. Now, crazily enough, Sapinsley was not the writer who adapted The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes for the episode of Night Gallery I mentioned, although that story does have so many obvious similarities to A Child Who's Crying. Uh, Rod Serling wrote that segment uh, for Night Gallery, but Sapinsley was offered sort of a consolation prize by having his teleplay for The Hand of Borges Weems produced to appear in that same episode of Night Gallery, the one that had the boy uh, who predicted earthquakes. The doctor that we're looking at here, I'll tell you a little bit about his name is His name is Bert Lytell. Uh, he's an old-time movie star from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, known for movies like A Meeting from Mars, To Have and to Hold, Never the Twain Shall Meet, uh, and he had starring roles in films like uh, this was a series of Alias, The Lone Wolf, The Last of the Lone Wolf, The Lone Wolf's Daughter, and The Lone Wolf Returns. He was Hollywood's original gentleman crook, uh, Boston Blackie, the first one to portray him in the movies. He's uh, the canteen master of ceremonies in Stage Door Canteen. And his TV career was looking fairly bright when this aired in 1951. He'd already been the host of one of the, the world's first uh, TV variety shows in 1948, a show called Hollywood Screen Test. And he was already a regular at this time on a show called One Man's Family. Uh, however, he passed away just three years after this, in September 1954, at the age of 69. There was uh, complications, apparently, due to a surgical procedure he underwent. And... Uh, Tell you a little bit about Robin Morgan here, our star. She was only five years old in 1946 when she landed her own WOR radio show uh, called Little Robin Morgan, and that she told stories and played records for other little kids around her age. Uh, she was heard regularly as a panelist on a, a radio show called Juvenile Jury. That was a children's sort of question and answer program that aired on the uh, two different networks, on the Mutual Network and on the NBC Network. Uh, Juvenile Jury, in fact, was hosted by Jack Barry. Uh, later did a lot of different game shows. 
That was actually just a couple of years before he'd go on to do Winky Dink and You in 1953. A lot of you might remember that as the first interactive kids show with the magic draw on TV screen. And uh, other child stars that were uh, panelists on Juvenile Jury included Bobby Breen, uh, whose claim to fame is probably that his image is among those seen on the cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album. On television, Robin Morgan became one of TV's first child stars in 1949 by playing one of the kids in a show called Mama, which ran from 1949 all the way to 1957. That was an early comedy drama about an immigrant family in San Francisco during the early 20th century. Uh, Mama was based on a, a Mama's Bank account by Catherine Forbes, probably best known as the source material for the 1948 film I Remember Mama. And these Mama TV shows also starred a young Dick Van Patten, who was in his early 20s then. And of course, he'd later be known as the dad on Eight is Enough. Around the same time that she did Tales of Tomorrow, Robin Morgan was in another creepy anthology that we mentioned a lot and mentioned earlier, Suspense. And uh, she co-starred in that episode with Boris Karloff in 1951, an episode called The Lonely Place. Uh, in 1952, right after this, she played Annie Oakley on Mr. Imagination. Uh, she starred as Alice in the 1954 Alice in Wonderland adaptation. It was staged on the TV show Craft Theater. And of course, she did the usual TV anthologies like the Alcoa Hour, uh, Pond Theater, Craft Theater, Danger. Uh, and she did several episodes also of that Robert Montgomery Presents. She pretty much retired from acting <clears throat> after appearing in over 150 episodes of the, that Mama TV series. And uh, after that, in the 60s, she became a member of the American Women's Movement, which is really what she's best known for. She served as the editor of Ms. Magazine, and she co-founded the Women's Media Center with Gloria Steinem and Jane Fonda. That's quite a trioka. Uh, she authored over a dozen books, including fiction, essays, nonfiction, poetry. Her 1970 anthology, Sister World is Powerful, was cited by the New York Public Library as one of the most influential books of the 20th century. She appeared in the 1981 documentary, Not a Love Story, a film about pornography. She's also uh, speaking about women's issues in the 2002 Miss America episode of the show American Experience. And she's talking about the same kind of things in the 2007 TV docu-movie 1968 with Tom Brokaw. She's been seen on TV in fairly recent documentaries. There's a 2015 miniseries called The 70s. And she can be seen in and the... Uh, 2018 TV special, 1968, The Year That Changed America, as her in that. And uh, just last year, in uh, 2021, uh, she talked about atheism and freedom from religion on a TV series called Free Thought Matters. Uh, where our commercials are, are cut uh, from this, uh, this kinescope that we're seeing here. Kinescopes, of course, are... Uh, you know, they, the reason we can watch these now is that they turned the camera towards the episode as it was broadcast and they filmed it. Uh, so I'll tell you about our congressman here. We've got the congressman and the general that want to persuade this doctor to persuade the little girl to tell them the future. Uh, as I mentioned, the government, they want to tap her brain. Um, they send both the, the general and the U.S. congressman here to do that uh, by whatever means necessary. The aggressive congressman wearing the dark suit here, he's played by Don McClelland. And he's actually a reporter and a newscaster in real life. Uh, the general, General Gates here, he's uh, played by Cal Thomas, who later became known as a famous right-wing political commentator. And uh, they're trying to talk the doctor into giving the little girl an injection of truth serum that will force her to reveal what she's been able to figure out about the future. And... Uh, of course, the other mutant super kids that she told them about, they want to know about them, too, because they're said to be scattered all over the world and presumably uh, ready to uh, take over the world and rule civilization if, uh, if the world really does end. So, this matron here that we're seeing, she, uh, she, she played in a whack soldier. Her um, actress name is Shirley Eggleston, and uh, she had very short Hollywood career. It seems to have started with this TV episode that we're watching. Uh, she's a little radio, and she was a regular uh, 55 TV series called Valiant Lady. But 
Check out her performance here. Although she has very little to do, she conveys a lot of this ethical dilemma she's facing about being ordered to uh, assist in drugging the little girl into compliance. It's really moments like this that the producer's choice uh, is, is really pays off to have made the, 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 the little boy into a little girl. The female soldier here, I mean, she's equally torn between her emotional misgivings and her devotion to duty and service. Uh, and the fact that the fate of the world is, you know, may hang in the balance really makes for, you know, a powerful moment of footage there. Uh, although we can't hear the music over this commentary, it's this dramatic uh, orchestral swell. It was probably canned music, but uh, very effective. Uh, once the, the little girl is drugged, of course, um, you know, their goal is to coerce her into telling them uh, what it is that she might be able to foretell about the future. She's already told them that uh, the world will probably end. There will only be uh, several million people left alive. Uh, her and her uh, couple of dozen other super children are probably going to only be, be the only survivors. Uh, when they ask her, uh, when, when, when they ask her who's going to win, she tells them, "Well, no one's going to win. The war is going to mark the terminal point of inter-country warfare." I think that's pretty close to the quote. Uh, and she tells them that she's really the only person among them who's going to survive. Uh, and of course, she's she's delivering this uh, all this bad news with this sort of same robotic, almost computerized tone of voice that she's used throughout the episode. It's uh, I guess you'd say it's kind of a cross between Mr. Spock and and maybe I don't know Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Um, you could say it's sort of a one-note performance, except that it's about to really change from uh, you know to to to. Uh, a fairly radical degree. There's a Rod Serling X twist. It really is what's lurking here underneath uh, underneath what we're watching now. Maybe an M Night Shyamalan twist, anyway, uh, where we discover that the truth serum that they gave her uh, is temporarily going to lower her intellect to that of a normal ten-year-old girl. Uh, although it's only going to do that for just a little while, uh, it turns out uh, it's it's. Well, that's really a necessary story development because if we're going to wrap this thing up in 22 minutes and keep it as brief and punchy as the original 4,000 word short story was, um, we, we, we have to get it to the point where we get to the, the, uh, what was promised in the title of the story, A Child is Crying. And of course, by having her regress to being a normal 10-year-old girl, uh, she's able to cry and finally put on uh, the a performance that shows she really is a normal little girl after all. At least she can be. Or at least she was for a few minutes there. And of course, she can no longer help them once she turns into this little girl. And for some reason or other here, as she wakes up, as we see, she looks around and uh, she, she's also, for some reason, which they don't really make clear, lost her memory of where she is and who these people are and what she's doing there. Uh, and really, I guess that doesn't need that much explanation because at the time, truth serums were in the news and they did cause a lot of, uh, you know, immediate psychological issue, issues, memory loss, and things like that. There's still people uh, claiming that uh, they're, they're having just now recovered memories of being victims of experiments and that sort of thing. But not to worry, the, the crying child will eventually stop crying and she'll get her intellect back just in time to rendezvous with all those other creepy mutant super kids. And uh, they can all make preparations to rule the post-apocalyptic Earth. So how's that for a happy ending, folks? <laughs> oh, by the way, before we're all blown up to pieces by nuclear bombs, would you like to take a look at some quality jewelry from the Jacques Chrysler Corporation or, or maybe some beauty blend carpets? Uh, you don't really want to go to your, your doom here with threadbare carpets and unglamorous jewelry, do you? <laughs> you really have to admire the, the, the way that the uh, sponsors were so brave to pay for bringing adult science fiction to television and then uh, after the world's blown up a couple times an episode then try to sell you a few things so that about takes us to this episode of uh, tales of tomorrow i want to thank you for letting me take over your speakers for the last 22 minutes and i hope you enjoyed the show